We have entered a period of constant uncertainty. Have we hit the bottom? Is the market going to go down another 50% and have its biggest crash in history? Or will we have another 10 years of bull market? While nobody knows for sure what's going to happen and when, people can see that the American dream is all but gone. Have a decent job, decent income, put money in a savings account and retire a millionaire. The government will care for you and your money. If any of this was ever true, it just isn't true anymore. Rising inflation means the economy is getting weaker. In June 2022, inflation hit a new 40-year high at 9.1%, four times higher than average. The prices are rising and money is losing its buying power. People have to pay more for goods and services and the money they make or have is losing its value. All this has been leading us to a recession and now that the US GDP has fallen over two quarters in a row, technically we're in one, although the authorities are unwilling to declare it. We will look at a system that benefits from this crisis or any crisis. It's an interconnected system of banks, the stock market, and the enormous industry of financial services that's getting bigger and bigger, and the people in charge keep getting richer and richer, while ordinary people are getting poorer and poorer. 61% of Americans don't have enough savings to cover a $1,000 emergency. 70 million of Americans don't or can't afford to save any of their annual income. Social Security is the primary source of income for pensioners, but the Social Security Trust Fund is expected to be depleted in 15 years. You used to be able to just put money in the bank and see it grow, but today, new claims of unemployment benefits are hitting their highest points. When the interest you get on a savings account is much smaller than the inflation, even if the amount grows by a little bit, your money will constantly shrink. And that makes it very important to learn to invest. In fact, it's one of the skills of the future, because keeping money in a savings account won't help. And money managers, as you will soon learn, are there to take your money. It's a good thing we have many investing resources now, tons of free content, free courses, free signals from brokers, commission-free trading. Or is it free? And are you free in your actions? And what's the purpose of all those financial tools we get? An estimated 20 million people started trading on their own in 2020. Maybe you are one of them. Was your investing experience successful? What's going to happen to all of us new investors? Are we smart enough not to lose on the stock market? The thing is, we are not playing against the stock market, but against the history will show. The history of losing money. On the 20th of February 2020, stock markets across the world suddenly crashed after growing instability due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The S&P 500 fell by 34%. In March 2020, the Federal Reserve reduced its target rate range for federal funds to zero. As a result, interest rates on all kinds of loans also dropped which made it less expensive to get a mortgage or a car loan in 2020 and 2021. The US government passed bills to stimulate the economy. These included help directed at specific sectors, cash payments to taxpayers, increased unemployment insurance and rental assistance. As economists say, this helped the US economy recover more quickly than it otherwise would have from the largest downturn since the Great Depression. The pandemic recession turned out to be the shortest on record and lasted only three months. This meant we could reopen after the lockdowns, people had money to spend on necessities, their credit rating wasn't affected, people weren't getting evicted and so on. Sounds great, huh? It looked like the government cared for its people, but actually the Federal Reserve Bank started printing money out of nothing as it usually did. $1.8 trillion went to families and individuals, $1.7 trillion went to businesses. If the deposit rates are close to zero, what do you do to save this money? That's right, you bring it to the stock market. According to the survey of Deutsche Bank, 
People plan to put 37% of any forthcoming stimulus checks from the government into stocks. In 2020, 15% of investors in the US stock market were first-time investors, and they were very successful. In the next one and a half years, the S&P 500 grew by 86%. It didn't matter what you bought, it would grow anyway, because of the influx of free money. What's better is that everyone started earning easily on the stock market, since it had recovered so fast. That happened because of one, extra money, two, commission-free trading, thanks to a price war kicked off by Robinhood in 2019, three, fractional shares, four, easy access to leverage, and five, because everything is accessible through a mobile app with fast connection speeds. And then there was a rise in social media, which is sort of a pandemic on its own. When making money on the rising market is so easy, everyone becomes a financial guru. And here you can see a growing number of financial bloggers who teach how to invest and trade. Let us know in the comments if the course that you bought paid itself off, or you actually lost money. It would be unfair to say that everyone lost money. Some traders got super rich on meme stocks and crypto. In fact, the stock market euphoria lasted almost two years after the COVID crash in March 2020, right until December 2021. Many tech stocks grew 40, 50, 70% in 2021, so people didn't have to pick stocks, everything was just growing. Bitcoin did a 10x from pandemic lows to new all-time highs. Some traders united against the big players on social media and made fortunes on GameStop and other stocks. Did many of them manage to sell at the right time? Probably not. The reality is, the majority of those new traders didn't know enough about trading and, one way or another, lost their pandemic gains. New research from London Business School economists found that beginner day traders managed to lose over $1 billion trading options on the bull market between November 2019 and June 2021. If you factor in the costs of trading that go to market makers, this adds up to $5 billion. Is this sustainable? Free money drove prices crazy high. To see what is driving the market, one thing to look at is the weighted average price to earnings, or PE ratio. In the US market, average PE weighted by companies' market capitalization is extremely high and is at multiple of 23. For some companies like Tesla or AMD, it was over 100. It means that the company's price is 100 times more than what the company actually earns. And if the company is worth $1 trillion or let's say $750 billion, what would you have to believe about its future performance to justify this valuation? Another measure often used by economists to predict a potential price bubble is the cyclically adjusted price to earnings, or CAPE, ratio. It's developed by the economist and Yale University professor Robert Schiller. The measure looks at firms' inflation-adjusted earnings per share over a 10-year period to indicate possible over- or undervaluation. As you can see in the graph, the overvaluation indicator was at its highest level since the dot-com bubble. At the end of June 2022, it was 29, just one point lower than the 30 mark it reached before the Black Tuesday crash in October 1929, which by the way triggered Great Depression. The historical mean of this indicator is 16.8. So when the market fell by 20% in the first half of 2022, it made perfect sense, because there was a bubble. And many economists warned that printing so much money is unsustainable and can lead to a huge crash. So what brought us to this? Clearly, it is not the first bubble. Has the bubble blowing started earlier? The main cause of the 2008 crash was banks' loose lending practices for mortgages, particularly bad ones, the ones that people wouldn't pay off, which had a ripple effect through the entire economy, resulting in the worst crash since the Great Depression. To put it simply, banks made money on giving out bad loans to people that were unlikely to ever pay them back. Problems began to occur when the Federal Reserve began increasing the federal funds rate, 
as it witnessed the emergence of a new bubble. By the end of 2005, this rate was 4.25%. The Fed raised the federal funds rate by a quarter of a point in 13 consecutive Federal Reserve meetings from June 2004. People's financial situations gradually changed. They began to miss mortgage payments because they had to pay more interest, and many defaulted on their mortgages. The recovery came from government bailouts, fresh injections of cash into the economy, and interest rates slashed to historically low levels. It took around 17 months for the market to recover, but when it did, that kicked off one of the longest and most profitable bull runs in history, which began in 2009 and lasted all the way to the pandemic in 2020. In this decade, the market regained more than 300% from the lows it hit in March 2009. The S&P reached an all-time high in August 2018 thanks to pro-business policies such as corporate tax cuts. And 2019 was a record-setting year too as stocks posted their best start in a year in at least 30 years. One of the unique parts about the decade-long bull market is that it's been driven by a couple different things in its life said Tom Issey, founder of Seventh Report Research. In the beginning, it was the Fed, the round after round of QE. That's what really got us going. Then, that transition to something more traditionally sustainable, which was an economic resurgence. We saw that in the middle of the decade. And then, tax cuts created an earnings-based bull market, which ended with the pandemic. Or did blowing stock market bubbles start earlier? Flashback to the 90s, between October 1990 and December 1992, the Federal Reserve dropped the overnight interest rate from over 9% to below 3%. In 96-97, regulations in the telecommunications industry were eased and marginal tax and capital gains tax rates were dropped. Thus, the perfect environment for capital flowed into the markets and provided the air for the dot-com bubble to grow. The federal funds rate was beginning to decrease, and the tech-dominated Nasdaq composite started to grow, crossing the 1,000-point mark for the first time in history. Everyone could see that the internet was growing, and the leading internet companies like Netscape were looking to cash in on this by doing IPOs or initial public offerings. IPOs of tech companies showed great returns often over 100% on the first day of a company becoming public. Linux grew almost 700%, the Globe.com 600%, and Foundry Networks grew by 525% all in the first day. This period marked the emergence of the widespread use and adoption of the internet, from shopping online, communication, and a source of news. The Nasdaq index rose by almost 600% from January 1995 to March 2000. It was a booming time, full of hopes. People got rich. Not me though. Share prices of internet companies grew much faster and higher than their peers in the real sector. This was mostly due to speculation caused by the excitement and euphoria on the new internet age. This led to a massive overvaluation of internet firms relative to their intrinsic value. Most of the dot-com companies springing up on the market had zero earnings. But the number of IPOs grew anyway. All these companies had was an idea. And they needed funding to make their idea a reality. Having an IPO was a way for many of these businesses to magically go from being worth nothing to being worth millions and billions of dollars within a short period of time. They could then just use this money to advertise their product to get the user's attention. But once again, this was a bubble created by venture capitalists, investment banks and brokerage houses, and of course the Federal Reserve. All of them made fortunes on the bubble, and they didn't care much if anything went wrong. So it's not surprising that this bubble also burst, because it was a bubble. The Nasdaq fell by 75% from March 2000 to October 2002, which erased most of the gains since the bubble started. You can already guess what the government did to save the economy. 
they dropped the interest rate. Because rates were low again, former chair of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, encouraged people to take adjustable rate mortgage loans rather than traditional fixed rate ones. A Federal Reserve report at the time claimed that Americans could save tens of thousands of dollars if they opted for an adjustable rate mortgage. This meant the interest rates on their mortgages were not fixed and could be even lower. So Americans began to take out adjustable rate mortgages. In 2004, a report showed that the number of adjustable rate mortgages had grown from 5% to 40% in just one year. And then you know what happened in the housing market just a few years later? Was it all a plan? Or was it caused by the previous bubble? Many of the current economic problems date back to one key event. The dollar used to be tied to the gold standard. So for every dollar there was a piece of gold held in reserve at the United States Bullion Depository at Fort Knox, and anyone could exchange their dollars for gold at any time, at least in theory. But the gold standard constrained the federal government and especially the Federal Reserve. This limited their ability to print as much money as they want. The disconnection from the gold standard happened in two major steps. Because of rising inflation, in 1971 President Nixon abandoned the gold standard to try to stop inflation and prevent foreign nations from overburdening the system by redeeming their dollars for gold, which is what it was in the first place. In essence, it was a huge default on the government's promise to provide gold for the dollar. It came as a result of the Fed printing dollars rapidly in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Because the dollar's purchasing power was falling, foreign central banks started redeeming gold and the US government started running out of gold. Rather than stopping the money printer, Nixon ended the dollar's redeemability in 1971. The money printing then accelerated even further, culminating in double-digit inflation around 1980. By contrast, inflation under the gold standard was never in double digits and averaged only 0 to 1% per year over the long term. In the 1930s, under President Franklin Roosevelt, the federal government already broke its promise to redeem Federal Reserve notes for gold. Private ownership and use of gold coins were prohibited. Individuals and banks were ordered to turn in their gold to the Federal Reserve at a set price. But why? According to Keynesian economic theory, one of the best ways to fight off an economic downturn is to inflate the money supply. That time, the plague the US economy needed to be saved from was the Great Depression. In the 1920s, the US entered a period of prosperity called the Roaring Twenties. Throughout the 20s, the US economy expanded rapidly and the nation's total wealth more than doubled between 1920 and 1929. The stock market, centered at the New York Stock Exchange on Wall Street, was the scene of reckless speculation where everyone from millionaire tycoons to cooks and janitors poured their savings into stocks. Throughout the 1920s, a long boom took stock prices to peaks never before seen. From 1920 to 1929, stocks more than quadrupled in value. Many investors became convinced that stocks were a sure thing and borrowed heavily to invest more money in the market. On October 24, 1929, as nervous investors began selling overpriced shares, the stock market crashed. A record 12.9 million shares were traded that day, known as Black Thursday. Five days later, on October 29th, or Black Tuesday, around 16 million shares were traded in another wave of panic on Wall Street. Millions of shares ended up worthless and those investors who had bought stocks on margin with borrowed money were wiped out completely. By 1930, 4 million Americans looking for work could not find it. That number had risen to 6 million in 1931. Meanwhile, the country's industrial production had dropped by half. Breadlines, soup kitchens, 
the rising number of homeless people became more and more common in America's towns and cities. Soon after taking office in March 1933, President Roosevelt declared a nationwide bank moratorium in order to prevent a run on the banks by consumers lacking confidence in the economy. On June 5, 1933, the United States went off the gold standard when Congress annulled the right of creditors to demand payment in gold. And that was the first step in disconnecting from gold standard. The United States had been on a gold standard since 1879, but bank failures during the Great Depression of the 1930s frightened the public into hoarding gold, making the situation unsustainable. In 1934, the government increased the price of gold to $35 per ounce. Because the Fed had quite a bit of gold, this increased their balance sheets by 69%. This allowed them to continue to inflate the money supply. Roosevelt created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, to protect the depositors' accounts, as well as the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, to regulate the stock market and prevent abuses that led to the stock market crash in 1929. What kind of abuses? In the 1920s, brokers were offering enormous leverages beyond the real capabilities of people to cover. With offering more leverage, they were earning higher commissions. They required investors to put in very little of their own money, thus attracting more people to the risky stock market. Leverage rates were up to 90% debt, which means people only had to use 10% of their own money. It was like winning in the casino, and it was not going to last. When the market started falling, many of those who traded on margin received margin calls. They had to either deliver more money to the brokers or their positions would be closed. Since many people did not have the funds to cover their positions, their shares were sold causing further market declines and even more margin calls. This was one of the major contributing factors that led to the stock market crash of 1929, which led to the Great Depression. The banks also contributed to the crash in extending too much credit and not maintaining enough reserves. Everyone got greedy, but then there came time to pay. The government introduced new regulations, but when it comes to earning money, there are always ways to trick people. Let's talk about banks. Banks were originally created to store money. Religious temples became the earliest banks because they were seen as a safe place to store money. Before long, temples also got into the business of lending money, much like modern banks. They would earn on the difference between borrowing and lending. Based on the theories of economist Adam Smith, some 18th century governments gave banks a relatively free hand to operate as they pleased. However, numerous financial crises and bank panics over the decades eventually led to increased regulation, just like after the Great Depression. Due to regulations, they can't freely set any interest rates for credit they want, so they have to be creative in making more money in addition to regulated lending. So on top of charging you credit card fees and overdrafts, they will charge you Paper statement fees, monthly or annual statement fees, telefees, return deposit fee, foreign transaction fee, lost card fee, fan card fee, redeeming reward points fee, return mail fee, and activity fees, interchange fees, and uh, just as a bonus, if you want to stop using their services, an account closing fee. Some countries have even implemented negative interest rates, so you have to pay for the privilege of holding your own money in your own account. The banks have always used your money to create more money with lending. But again, there is always room for creativity. Every time a bank makes a loan, under banking regulations they are required to set aside certain reserves of capital for the loan, in the event the loan is not paid off at 100% as expected. Well of course, if you don't have to do that and if you're a bank, you'd prefer not to do that because then you can finance more freely and take on more debt. So banks have created swaps to be able to loan more money. They would find someone who could take on their loan risk and free up capital. That organization would receive compensation from the bank for taking on or assuring credit risk. And so risk was essentially dispersed. This was a major financial innovation 
credit derivatives made it possible for a bank to skirt capital requirements. And that's what happened. The amount of capital the banks had to hold got less. And so banks became able to create more and more credit. They could make more loans. The rest is history. Just like before the Great Depression, when the lot of credit is given to those who can't pay, eventually it's going to collapse. In the Great Depression, the Fed let the banking system and the money supply collapse. But in 2008, it bailed out the banks because... The banking system is important to society! The housing bubble burst, causing the fourth largest investment bank Lehman Brothers to file for bankruptcy. At least 29 trillion was used to bail out the financial system during the crash. The American people were told that this was necessary to save the economy. Not because banks were gambling with people's mortgages and creative money out of nothing, putting everyone at risk. When any other business fails, it goes bankrupt. But not banks. Banks are important. We were told the collapse of Wall Street giants would freeze the payment system and people wouldn't be able to get credit. Businesses wouldn't be able to pay their employees and that's why the big banks need to be saved. And that's why the government needs to help them, courtesy of taxpayers. In fact, they were bailed out for doing a bad job and making money on everyone else. Out of the $29 trillion in bailouts, $8.2 trillion were given to the six biggest banks in the country, the six megabanks, during the 2008 crash. So nearly one-third of all the bailouts went to them. And the executives got massive bonuses from these bailouts. This was a massive transfer of wealth from Main Street to Wall Street to prevent the bankruptcy of just six banks supposedly because they were vital to the economic security and prosperity of Main Street Americans. The bailouts were not only given to banks that take deposits and make loans, they were given to all kinds of financial institutions, including those engaging in the most dangerous high-risk activities that actually caused the financial crash. So financial institutions like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, AIG and others were allowed to maximize their profits with almost no regulation. But when they caused a crash, they were bailed out by the government. The history repeats itself. Every following crisis is caused by years of printing money and the people that benefit the most are the big guys. The Fed prints money, so well, uh, they, they can have as much money as they want. The big banks make money and if they fail, they get bailed out. And the financial services industry finds ways to get money out of the people, especially at the promise of good returns on investment. You don't believe me? Look at these charts. The light blue line is financial profits since 1970s. It's growing. This is the revenue of one of the largest brokerage firms in the US, Charles Schwab. It's growing. This is the revenue of Robinhood. It's growing. And this is the household savings since 1970s. Can you see the trend? We have looked at the role of the banks. Let's look at other players. We'll start with brokers. The broker's reputation has always been a notorious one. In 1984, Washington stockbroker Les Silverstone walked into the office of Arthur Lever Jr., the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. He had things to say about how Wall Street's biggest brokerage firms routinely scam their investors with business practices Silverstone described as deceptive and unethical. The consumer is getting ripped off. The contests inside firms create a culture that is detrimental to the consumer. What you need from your broker is best thinking about how to achieve your long-run financial goals is exactly what the contest is forcing the broker not to give you. Sales scripts are used in many industries as an accepted way to generate business. But Silverstone said brokerage sales scripts often get around the intent of SEC regulations and lead to bad advice to customers. What broker is going to advise his clients to sell a poorly performing fund when he is getting paid thousands of dollars a year to keep them invested in it. Retail investing gave even more people access to the market and once again showed that the companies providing services care much more about their own pockets 
than about their clients' pockets. Just like in the 1920s, a big percentage of those inexperienced investors would lose money in the crash, selling low and buying high. The market works for the big guys, not the ordinary people. All the new tools, commission-free trading, fractional shares, investing from one dollar, appear to be giving ordinary people the same tools that the rich investors use. But in a way, it was just a facade. When GameStop happened in 2021 and thousands of retail investors were going to win big, brokers like Interactive Brokers and E-Trade and Robinhood itself blocked the opportunity to buy more shares. So much for democratizing investments. The guy that takes from the poor and gives to the rich, I mean, the other way around. Let's see how democratization works. What do they offer? Commission-free trading. Commission-free trading is a relatively new development where brokers get payment for order flow, PFOF. Most brokers like Robinhood and Fidelity don't charge commissions directly from investors, but split profits with market makers. By having the trade flows directed to them, market makers can better predict the trade volume and set bid-ask spreads more efficiently. Retail investors, as it happened before, pay a slightly higher price to buy securities than to sell them. In this sense, the spread is not new. However, PFOF allowed drop-in commissions as the main source of income for brokers and made the trading sound more lucrative for retail investors. The no-fee trades attracted a lot of new clients to Robinhood and other platforms. And when money is in abundance and people feel like taking a risk, why not teach them the fastest way to drain their deposits? Introducing options trading. According to CBOE Global Markets report, 2021 has been a breakout year for these derivative contracts. This trading activity represents a 31% increase on 2020 and the highest amount ever recorded since exchange-traded options first started trading back in 1973. Although the BDASK spread is very small in regular stocks, the average spread for options with less than a week to expiration is a whooping 12.3% researchers from London Business School found. The average quoted spread of retail trades across all maturities is more than 13% compared with 11% for the overall market. Therefore, traders might underestimate the indirect trading costs in the options market. The more they trade, the more they lose because of these BDASK spreads every time they have to pay the round-trip trading costs, the research found. The next four come in a bunch to add volume. Number one, fractional. In November 2019, Interactive Brokers became the first of the major online brokers to offer trading shares in fractions. On January 2020, Fidelity announced it will also offer fractional share trading of equities and ETFs. So a huge number of people got the opportunity to invest small sums of money into a growing market just weeks before the market crashed because of the COVID pandemic. A huge number of people got the opportunity to buy something like Amazon, a stock that was worth around $1,800 in November 2019. The market was happy because of the influx of new blood. Number two, free courses. The idea is simple. You come to the market not understanding how it works, how to pick stocks, when and why to sell them. A scared person is a conservative person. So the goal of free education is to calm you down and make you more confident in making moves. Whether or not you make money over time doesn't matter to the market because the more you trade, the more brokers earn, whichever way the stock prices go. So you are offered to take a course on investing or trading. Once you learn the meaning of PE and EPS, you feel confident or at least curious to implement new knowledge and start filling up your portfolio with stocks rather than something more reliable but seemingly boring like the S&P 500. Number three, free signals. Perhaps signals are a separate thing for which there is a special kettle in hell. Signals are made for those who haven't finished free education courses and want to pass responsibility. 
So you get all kind of promises that if you follow the advice, you get to earn together with market professionals. And of course, you are only fed positive statistics on how all the signals work. There would be nothing wrong with honest signals, but again, we are dealing with the system that is able to and wants to profit from itself. So whenever you get a signal or a price target, think about who benefits from that. 4. Top up and leverage. In order for you to use the free info more, you are offered amazing terms for trading with leverage or margin. At some point, capital inflow slows down, so brokers need to come up with a way to increase return on capital. Margin trading is a logical step to achieving it. A broker loans funds to clients, which allows them to trade more. The more they trade, the more the brokers earn. That's what happened in the Great Depression and it has been happening ever since. Every country has a different regulations on how much margin a broker-dealer can provide clients with and in the US it's about 50%. So volume is king and the industry pushes you to trade more. Another thing to increase volume is social investing. Now, there are a bunch of services offering to follow investment ideas of your friends. And of course, social pressure will nudge you to trade more together with friends. The problem is that if more people make bad decisions buying into hype, it doesn't make the decisions better. And if people that buy in hype are making the prices go up, that doesn't actually make the company's business or products better. It just makes the stock more volatile. And when the hype switches to something else, the stock prices tend to go down below to what owning the S&P 500 would give you. So inside of the system of the government, together with the Fed and big banks, together with big corporations running the show, there are people in Wall Street that will recommend to you what to invest in. They will feed you analytics and forecasts. Research has shown that flipping a coin gives you more accurate predictions than the forecast of leading economists. In 2016, Bloomberg analyzed predictions by forecasters over 17 years from 1999 to 2016. And they found that although there was a reasonably high correlation between the average forecast and the year-end price of the S&P 500 index for the given year, these predictions were surprisingly unreliable during major shifts in the market. And this is where, indeed, you need professionals the most. Look at this. This is a visualization of a survey of professional forecasters on 10-year treasury yield. It basically shows that at each given point in time, there was a forecast the yield would go up. In the words of Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors of all time, investing is a simple game, but financial advisors have convinced the public that it's harder than it actually is. Speaking at the 2022 annual Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting, he said, you can have monkeys throwing darts at the page and, you know, take away the management fees and everything. I'll bet on the monkeys over the advisors. And we're told we need them because who else will tell you what to do with your money, right? Of course they will tell you it's very hard and you need their services like you won't be able to work out your risk profile and you won't be able to choose companies. You go to a specialist and he won't tell you to go read Kiyosaki and think for yourself. He'll tell you, bring your money to him and he or she will make you rich. But the thing is, they can't make you rich. They can only make themselves rich and they don't know you. All they can do is ask a few questions to find out your risk profile, your interests and so on. And you can do that by yourself. It doesn't take that long. It's an approach for those who want to be told what to do. I don't want to be overly critical. Sometimes we need advice. For example, about taxes, about how some industry we want to invest in works. But please, do not give up responsibility for your own wealth. You have seen that the market moves cyclically. You have seen ways the financial system makes money on you. Because the financial services industry is a business, they will do anything to get money out of the general population. It is full of noise, and the goal of that noise is to confuse you. So what can you do? Investing is simple. 
When it comes to investing, doing it yourself is the best because that way you make the decisions yourself and taking responsibility here is key. There are two types of investing, active and passive. Active investing is buying or selling stocks for a short term less than nine months or so. There is also trading, where the holding period is under a month. Day trading is buying and selling stocks within a one-day time frame. And then there is high-frequency trading, which is just seconds or less. There are successful cases of each, but statistics say that 97% of all individuals who persisted for more than 300 days lost money. A study published in June 2019 of almost 1,600 day traders between 2013 and 2015 in the Brazilian equity market, which is by the way the third largest in terms of volume, concluded that only 3% made money. They say, we show that it is virtually impossible for individuals to day trade for a living, contrary to what course providers claim. Do you believe you'd be in that 3%? If you think that investing professionals should be better at trading, the statistics show the opposite as well. When we talk about performance, it's important how we measure it. Usually, we compare everything with the general market, meaning the S&P 500. So we compare any collection of stocks with the performance of the whole market. And then we say if you beat the market or not. It may sound surprising, but about 90% of index funds which track companies of all sizes did better than active funds. Over a 20-year period, about 90% index funds tracking companies of all sizes outperformed their active counterparts. Even over three years, more than half of index funds did better, according to a 2020 report from the S&P Indices versus Active. In 16 of the 18 categories tracking US equities focused funds, more than half the funds underperformed their benchmark. Particularly noteworthy were the 98.6% of large cap growth funds that failed to beat the growth of the S&P 500 growth. It's an index composed of large capitalization US equities that exhibit growth characteristics. Fund managers often respond to evidence of active underperformance by claiming to offer better returns per unit of volatility, meaning to outperform in risk-adjusted terms. This would be an appropriate counter-argument, if only it were true. However, the data shows that the vast majority of actively managed funds underperformed on this metric as well. Among domestic equity funds, an even greater 95% underperformed the S&P Composite 1500 on a risk-adjusted basis. Passive investing is buying and holding stocks for a longer period of time. It's like you bought an Apple share together with your first iPhone in 2014 and kept holding it. Advantages of passive investing are the following. The first one, lower costs. Because there is less trading volume with passive investing, this brings the costs down for investors. Passively managed funds charge lower fees than most active funds as there is very little need for research and maintenance. The average expense ratio for passive mutual funds in 2020 was 0.06%. Passive ETFs came in at 0.18% compared to a range from 0.5 to 1.5% for actively managed funds. 2. Decreased risk Passive strategies are usually fund-focused. Here you are usually investing in hundreds if not thousands of stocks and bonds. This makes diversification easy and makes it less likely for one bad stock to bring down your whole portfolio. If you're doing active investing yourself and don't have diversification, there's always a risk of this. Number three, increased transparency. Passive investing is transparent, so what you see is what you get. What an index tracks is usually in its name, and it won't hold investments outside of that. Actively managed funds don't always provide this transparency. Many of the decisions are up to the fund manager and some techniques may be kept secret from the general public in order to make the fund more competitive. 4. Higher average returns If you are investing for the long term, as you should be, all kinds of passive funds almost always give higher returns. Now you can ask, 
But how do I know what to buy? Despite all the noise, investing is actually very simple. You can buy shares of companies that you believe will do well. A company earns money, works on improving its business. You buy its shares and hold them for a long time and get rich without trying. You only need two things to become an investor. Enough income to invest on top of your living expenses and patience. Patience is key because the stock market is a long bumpy road of delayed gratification. And those who wait win in the long term. Of course, you need to know what to invest in. But once you are invested, there is barely anything you need to do from then on. If you don't believe in anything in particular, you can invest in the American economy as a whole. So something like the S&P 500, the index fund that tracks the performance of 500 largest companies in the US. Peter Lynch recommends new investors to stick to what they know. Instead of pursuing the hot thing today, like tech stocks, or worse, investing in a hype you don't understand like biotech, can be detrimental to your success over time. First, there's almost no way for you to know which company's business is doing well if all you're looking at is its stock price. Second, as hype changes and something new becomes fashionable, you are also likely to lose interest in something you don't believe in in the first place. So instead, Lynch recommends to invest in what you know. If you're in the restaurant business, then it's a good idea to invest in some of the great companies in the industry. If you go to a hotel and you like it, and if the experience is great time after time, then the business is likely to do well. And if the stock's price is doing well only because someone is good at Twitter, after a certain period of time, this added hype value will disappear just like it came about. A stock is most likely to grow in the long term because the company is doing well, not just the stock price. In the end, there are always two types of people, those who make the rules and those who follow them. Einstein said that you have to learn the rules of the game, and once you learn them, you have to play better than anyone else. Now that you know the rules of the game, play your own investing game.